morning, and thank you for joining us for worship this day. It's the first Sunday in Lent. All during this Lenten season, uh, we're going to be delving into temptation uh, as we re remember Jesus' journey to the cross for us. So today, uh, our emphasis is going to be on the trials and temptations of life uh, from James, from James chapter 1. So, so thankful you joined us uh, for worship this day. So we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Father God, thank you so much for bringing us into your presence. Fill us with your spirit now. Teach us from your word. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
all the hearts who are content and all who feel unworthy and all who hurt with nothing will know that you are holy will know And all will sing out Alleluia And we will cry out Alleluia And all will sing out Alleluia And we will cry out Alleluia Go on and scream it from the mountains. Go on and tell it to the masses that he is gone. Shout it. Go that he Good morning. The first reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with them, with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. 
Then Abraham said to his young to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand for the reading of the gospel, the holy gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter beginning at verse 9. The first chapter of St. Mark, uh, beginning at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the gospel of our Lord, and praise to you, O Christ. So in our, church, in our prayers today, we want to pray for people that have been affected by the storms recently. We pray that they're coming out of that now, the power is restored to everybody, uh, and that uh, damage is being repaired. So we pray for the people that have been affected. We we'll also pray for the ongoing pandemic, and we pray for success of uh, treatments, a vaccine, people would take care of themselves uh, when we would just love our neighbor. Uh, we pray for this nation as well. Lord God, we come into your presence. We're thankful for this day that you have blessed us with, for the gift of life that you have given to us, for the strength to endure the tri- trials of life, knowing that we're held in your everlasting and loving arms. May the trials bring us closer to you, Lord. And Lord God, help us to resist temptation, to flee from temptation 
to not lay blame at somebody else's feet, but Lord God, to look to you for strength to resist the devil and um, to resist those who would try to entice us to follow a different path in life. We need you desperately, Lord God, and so we cry out to you. Father God, we ask that you would um, be with those who are hurting right now, uh, being due loss of property, loss of loved ones in the storms. Uh, Lord, we ask that, uh, that, that neighbor would help neighbor, that it would just be really a time where the church would shine forth and really bless those and help those who have needs. So Lord God, we look to you uh, for, uh, for how to best help people that have lost so much. We also pray, Lord God, that um, you would be with people still suffering from the, the virus. We ask, Lord God, for success of the treatments. We pray for, uh, that people would take care of themselves emotionally, physically, uh, spiritually, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to turn to you, the true and the living God, but also to care for the bodies that you have given to us. We pray for the success of the vaccine and that there would not be any side effects for people that have received the vaccine. We pray, Lord God, that it would successfully squash uh, the spread of this virus and, and that uh, the case count would continue to go down. We pray for healthcare workers that are, have worked so diligently, and we pray that you would be with them. We pray for this nation. We pray for the leaders of this nation, that they would repent and turn to you and seek you with all their heart, mind, and spirit that our leaders would humble themselves and realize that they cannot solve the problems that we face by their own uh, ingenuity, their own supposed wisdom, but that we need wisdom from on high, that every good and perfect gift comes from you, dear, dear Jesus. And so we need to look to you and may our leaders turn to you and look to you. May we as the church humble ourselves, turn to you and look to you. Uh, we cry out to you, we desperately need you as a people, as a nation, as a society, and the world desperately needs you. Help us to joyfully proclaim the good news of Jesus to our neighbors this week. Lord God, place on our heart those that we know in the workplace, in our schools, in our neighborhoods that don't yet know you and walk with you. Place that on our heart. May we be in prayer for them and may we love them well and point them to Jesus who gives life and forgiveness. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus, who's taught us to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
out your spirit upon the broken. Oh, loving Father, come and hear us. We see your glory. We sing as one. We are your message today, we're going to be looking at our epistle reading from the book of James, James chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. The title of this message is The Trials and Temptations of Life. And uh, as we go through our, our, our Lenten journey together and remembering Jesus' journey to the cross for us, we're going to be taking a look at various aspects of temptation that we face in our own lives and how we need to constantly come back to Jesus and we need some strong Christian friends in our life as well to help us to walk through the things that we struggle with in our own life. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, open our hearts and minds to you now. We pray that you would teach us from your word. We pray that we would be open to your teaching and that we would not just gain some head knowledge, but that you would truly change our hearts and our minds. Make us more into the image of your son, our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. May we always look to him who is the author and perfecter of our faith. We pray in his mighty name. Amen. <clears throat> so it is clear from the Bible, uh, in fact, from our reading from James uh, chapter 1, I think verse 13, that God doesn't tempt anyone. That's not what he's in the business of doing. Uh, however, it is equally clear that uh, from our passage in James that uh, God allows tests and trials to come into our life. So we undergo these trials, we undergo these tests in our life. So what is the difference between tempting and testing? Well, think about this for a moment. A good test that is administered to somebody teaches that person what they know and what areas they need to grow in. You know, like what they don't know, what they need to work on. So if I test somebody and my motives are right, my motives are good, then the goal of testing someone is to help them to grow. That's why you give the test. You want them to grow. You want them to, to move forward. You want them to succeed. If my motives are bad in testing someone, my goal is for them to fail and to tear them down. So we can easily put that, uh, someone to that kind of test. We, I think it's easier for us to do than we'd like to admit. Uh, so we put somebody to the test, kind of hoping they're gonna fail, and then saying, see, I knew you wouldn't be able to do what I asked you to do. You're just a failure. And so the test was made to tear that person down to reveal what we thought we knew about that person that was a bad thought that we knew about that person. And we gave them that test in the hopes that they would fail. That's Satan's goal. He wants to tear us down. See, I knew they would fail, God. 
See, he's the accuser. Look at that. Look at that person. Look at Brian. He failed again. He's no good. He doesn't really love you. He doesn't really want to follow you. Why do you care about him? Why do you care about uh, uh, you guys? So Satan's goal as the accuser is to always tear us down. At the beginning of his letter, James uh, says this in James chapter 1, verse 2, before our reading, in James 1, verse 2, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let, stead, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How can trials uh, of various kinds be counted as joy in your life? That's what James says, counted as joy. They can only be counted as joy if they're endured in faith. If they're endured in trusting more in God, then they can be counted as joy. Let me put it to you this way. I would not be the person I am today and Stacy, my wife, would not be the person she is today if we hadn't endured trials in our life. We hadn't gone through them. We wouldn't be where we are today. And so we can look back on those trials with joy because it brought us closer to Jesus. The trials revealed to us our need for his strength and, and to look to him always to get through this life. So you lack nothing, it says, James says that you lack nothing when you have Jesus, even in the midst of the difficult and horrible things that can come in, and the worst trials that can come into your life. It is, if our faith is only a surface faith, then the trials of life reveal it as only a surface faith, that it's a faith that we have in God only if things are going our way, only if God is reacting the way we think God should react to whatever trials we face in our life. Uh, so we limit God, and we think that God's purpose is to make me happy. And then when the trials come along, we're gravely disappointed. Jesus talks about that kind of faith that only trusts in God when things are going your way, when you think God is doing what you think he should do. When he told the parable of the spreading of the seed, the throwing of the seed, which is the word of God. And he said this in Luke 8, 13. And the seed uh, are, the, are the ones that are on the rock, the seed on the rock is the ones in the rock, are those who, when they hear the word, they receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in a time of testing, they fall away. God didn't do what they wanted them to do at the moment of their testing. Instead of us learning from our trials, if we're in this situation where we're thinking God needs to do what we need, we need to tell him to do, we essentially reverse things and we put God to the test to see if he will respond the way we think he should respond to us. Israelites did this in the wilderness. The book of Hebrews 3, starting in verse 7, reminds us of this. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test. This is God speaking. Your fathers put me to the test and saw my, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So the trials that God allows us to face in our life when we have faith have one goal. Verse 12 in James chapter 1. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life 
which God has promised to those who love him. See, the trials of life draw you to trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone, who holds the crown of life, who desires to give you the crown of life. And he does that at tremendous cost, the cost of his very own life. But temptation, see, we're talking about trials and testing. Temptation is a different thing. So the test that Satan, uh, the test that Satan or another person brings into your life has a goal not of bringing life to you, but destruction. The, dece the de deceitful part is that the destruction is, to, is made to look enticing. It's made to look appealing. God's not in that business. He brings us life. Verse 13 speaks of God. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But even though other people may be at work to tempt you, or Satan may be at work to tempt you, in the end, we can't blame anyone else. The succumbing to temptation points right back to me when I succumb, points right back to you when you succumb to temptation. Verse 14 and 15, but each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Years ago, there was an African-American comedian, Flip Wilson, whose punchline was always, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil. When we succumb to temptation, we would like to blame someone else. That's what Eve did. The serpent deceived me and I ate of the fruit. In other words, Satan, the devil made me do it. That's what Adam did. He blamed God. The woman you made God she gave me of the fruit and I ate. But we can't point the finger at others or the circumstances of our life or our upbringing or that we're tired or that we're hungry or that we had a busy day at work or that we've, there's a lot of stress in our life right now. God holds us accountable for our behavior. It doesn't mean there aren't some very real issues that we have in our lives that need to be dealt with. There is tremendous hurt that people carry around and their behavior maybe reflects that hurt. But here's the thing, we need to stop blaming others. If we need help, we need to get help. We need to admit it, admit it and reach out for help and stop blaming others. And there's a great pull in our society to blame others for our problems, to blame others for our circumstances, to blame others for what's going on. It's the man who's keeping me down. It's the government that's keeping me down. It's that person in office right now that I can't stand and they're ruining my life right now. It's that mean professor and they're not fair at all. We try anything but admitting to our own failure and to our own sin. The Bible describes sin as folly because it is the height of foolishness to believe that we're going to be the first person in history to get away with sin. It's folly to believe that. It's folly to, to, to blame somebody else. So the Bible describes it as just foolishness. It's folly. When we go down that path, we deceive ourselves, it says in the Bible, and the truth is not in us, all the time heading towards our own death and destruction. But there is a way out. There's good news for you. There's good news for me. There's a way forward in life. There is a way, there is life if we but receive it. 
So verse 16 and following, James says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Or of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The perfect gift of God came in the form of a, of a babe wrapped in swallowing clothes in a manger. God with us, God incarnate, Jesus came to us in the flesh, God's gift to sinful, broken human beings in rebellion against him that give into temptation time and time again in our lives. He's the word of truth. So he speaks truth over us. He speaks of our brokenness. He does speak of our failure. He does speak of our rebellion, but he also speaks another truth to us. I forgive you. He speaks those words over you, over me, when we fail. I forgive you. You and I will surely face many temptations in this life. We can't go through a day without facing temptation of some sort. And the sad reality is, at times we may fall. What will you do then? Here's what Satan wants you to do. Run from God. Hide what you've done. Try to take care of it on your own. Don't let anybody else know what you're struggling with. That's what Satan wants. Cover it up. Instead, Jesus invites us to run to him, to confess to him, to receive healing at the foot of the cross, to confess to one another so that we can help one another in the struggles that we have. He invites us to do that. He invites you, in other words, he invites you into relationship, into community, into life, instead of isolation and shame and guilt. He invites you into life and community and forgiveness. He has done that for you. Do you know that that is God's desire for you this day? Life, abundant life, whole life, being holy and completely held by him in his everlasting and loving arms. God is for you. He is not against you. He loves you. And he's given everything for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have not rejected us, but you love us and invite us into a relationship with you. We're so thankful, Lord God, that you don't give up on us. Even though time and again we have fallen, we are weak, you are strong. We are broken, but you make us whole. We are guilty, but you declare us not guilty. Thank you for the tremendous gift of your grace. Thank you for putting other Christians in our lives that we can talk to and wrestle through the issues of life that we're dealing with, the weaknesses that we have, and be encouraged by one another. So teach us, Lord God, and lead us. We pray in Jesus' mighty name and help us to love well the people that you've placed in our community. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us uh, speak together our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed, this ancient creed that was uh, put together that's a summation of the Christian faith. So please stand.
as we speak our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We're having a, a time of confession before the Lord, and the Lord knows what's really on our heart, but what he's inviting us to do is come before him, be honest before him, come into his presence, uh, don't hide anything from him, run to him. It's a mistake for us to run from God, we should run towards him and confess to him. So let us, let's open our hearts and our minds to him. There'll be a time of silence as well that we can really pour out our hearts to God. So from the words uh, from, the, from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment in silence to reflect upon our need for Christ. So Lord, let us confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserved your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the gift of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this day on this first Sunday in Lent, uh, as we're going to be continuing to reflect on the temptations that we face in life. We're going to be having Wednesday evening services. Those will be live streamed as well at 7 p.m. in Eastern Time on Wednesday evenings. And there'll just be a short teaching se session. And then we break off into small groups. You can do the small group at your home. We can send you the small group materials. So again, if you would like small group materials, please let me know. Uh, email me at Pastor B as in boy, Spang, S-P-A-N-G at comcast.net and i'll be happy to send you our small group materials for our wednesday evening discussions as we continue to delve through temptation so go forth with the lord's blessing may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the lord look upon you with his favor and give you 
his peace. Amen. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sins. You are peace, you are peace, when that fear is crippling. My heart will sing no other name.